Now I'd like to talk about the material that runs roughly from pages 90 to 96, which is a very famous part of this dialogue and one of the most famous parts of Plato's whole work, and unique because so Socrates actually tells a story about himself, which he really does, and his own intellectual development, and uh, there is a lot of interesting material here. The immediate context is Socrates wanting to respond to, I think it's Sebes', Sebes argument, about the soul, and that is that even though the soul may pre-exist the body, and even though it may inhabit many bodies which die and it continues to live, who's to say that at a certain point it does not die as well? So he wants to respond to that. He takes that argument very seriously. He says uh, on the middle of, in the middle of page 90, this is a very serious inquiry which you are raising, Sebes, involving the whole question of generation and corruption. About which I will, if you like, give you my own experience, and you can apply this if you think that anything which I will say will avail toward the solution of your difficulty. And really, this section between pages 90 and 96 provides foundation for Socrates' eventual refutation, or attempted refutation, of the idea that the soul could eventually wear out and die, and, and the conclusion he comes to is that the soul cannot admit of death and cannot become dead any more than, let's say, the number three, which is odd, could become even. And that it's as unthinkable. We'll, we'll, we'll eventually get to that. But So he tells a story uh, from his youth, and um, really this is a very wide-ranging little section here, because it's not just about how we should think about the soul, whether it's immortal or not. or It's really about reality, and it's about how we might try to come to grips with reality and how we explain things that we find in reality and different options. And I would say that what Socrates is doing here is opting for a method of explanation which again employs these things called the forms. And also very importantly rejects a method of explanation which we might call a materialist view or a, uh, a physicalist explanation where we attempt, we attempt to understand the world by way of physical explanations. Now, he says that as a youth, he was much interested in what is called natural science. That's at the bottom of page 90. Natural science uh, might be understood as physics, the attempt to understand the nature of the physical world. Socrates says, This appeared to me to have lofty aims, as being the science which had to do with the causes of things, the, the ultimate uh, principles uh, or causes or reasons of things. You might say... Um, the atom is such a cause that he's looking for. Like in, in modern physics, the idea of the atom might be that kind of cause in Socrates' mind. That is the, the ultimate principle of matter. And so he says that as a youth, he was interested in the physical world, in nature. Uh, but he admits that he was not very good at physics, you might say. At the top page 91, he says, at last I concluded that I was wholly incapable of these inquiries, as I will satisfactorily prove to you, for I was fascinated by them to such a degree that my eyes grew blind to things that I had seen to myself and also others to know quite well. And this notion of becoming blind by looking too closely at physical things comes up again. That is, um, he thought that he understood the world in a sort of common sense way, but the more that he began to try to understand physical nature, the less sense that world made to him. Uh, and then he, he talks on page 92 of finding a book of a philosopher, a philosopher previous to him named Anaxagoras, and uh, being very disappointed in it. And, and why? Because although Anaxagoras claims to say that mind or thought or reason is at the basis of the universe. Anaxagoras, too, turns out, in Socrates' mind, at least to be kind of a, a materialist. And on top page 93, he says, I might compare him to a person who began by maintaining generally that mind is the cause of the actions of Socrates, but who, when he endeavored to explain the causes of my several actions in detail, went on to show that I sit here because my body is made up of bones and muscles, and the bones are hard and have ligaments which divide them, and the muscles are elastic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That is, that Anaxagoras, in explaining why the universe is, and, and what sort of place it is, and uh, what its ultimate causes are, resorted to physical explanations, and Socrates thinks that really, actually, this is not only disappointing, this is absurd. 
For instance, we could ask the question, why is Socrates sitting in the prison? And Socrates says, uh, well, my, uh, my limbs are bent and I, my posture is curved. And he says, we could assign 10,000 other causes of the same sort, forgetting to mention the true cause. That is, what is the true cause of him sitting in the prison? Which is that the Athenians have thought fit to condemn me, and accordingly, I have thought it better and more right to remain here and undergo my sentence. That is, the true cause of Socrates sitting in the prison is that he decided to stay in the prison. That is, he decided not to run away. He decided to, that it would be the just, the best thing to do to accept the death sentence rather than do something unlawful and run away. And that to say that uh, he's there or he's sitting there because of physical reasons just simply misses the point. And then he says, I am inclined to think that these muscles and bones of mine would have gone off to Megara or Boeotia, other Greek cities. By the dog of Egypt they would if they had been guided by their own idea of what was best. And if I had not chosen as the better and nobler part uh, to stay here, etc. So he says, um, if we're looking for true answers about why the world is as it is, we shouldn't look for purely physical explanations because they don't really give us answers. Well, what does? He says on page 94, around the, beginning, the middle of the page, he says, I thought that as I had failed in the contemplation of true existence, I ought to be careful that I did not lose the eye of my soul, as people may injure their bodily eye by observing and gazing on the sun during an eclipse, unless they take the precaution of only looking at the image reflected in the water. That occurred to me, and I was afraid that my soul might be blinded altogether if I looked at things with my eyes or tried by the help of the senses to apprehend them. That is, the senses which give us access to the material world will not give us the true reasons why the world exists, why the world is as it is, and won't give us true understanding of the world. Well, what will? He says, and I thought I had better have recourse to ideas, to concepts, to what he eventually will admit are the forms or essences, and seek in them the truth of existence. But what does that mean? Well, he goes on to say, um, for instance, uh, why is something beautiful? Is it beautiful because of any physical reasons? Is it beautiful because of color, or form? Uh, we ask an art historian why a particular painting is beautiful. Is it beautiful because of composition, uh, the use of brush strokes, uh, the uh, particular uh, colors that are involved? Th those things, Socrates says, just lead us astray. Those are the things that make us blind. Why is it beautiful? Uh, I cannot help thinking that if there be anything beautiful other than absolute beauty, that can only be beautiful insofar as it partakes of absolute beauty. That is, why is something beautiful? Because in some, how or no, uh, some sense or another, it partakes or participates in the essence or pure idea of beauty. Um, so, uh, Socrates is, is in this section, 90 to 96, is really explaining how he comes to the theory of the forms and how he, he rests on the theory of the forms. He has faith in that as the best way, maybe not the, a guaranteed way to achieve truth, but the best way to achieve truth is, is through ideas, through recourse to uh, the forms.